you know, I'm not going to accept what I've been handed. Like, these aren't the cards I've been dealt. I can, you know, it's, it's basically like, um, almost like fate. Like I need to, or my own destiny. I need to figure out my own destiny. I, if, if I want to be successful in whatever it's going to be, then I need to do it. I don't need to give myself excuses. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. I'm Bill Gassiamis. And recently, Spotify released a new feature which allows people to now rate their favorite shows similarly or in a similar way to the way the Apple podcast app allows it. So even if you're not somebody who uses Spotify to listen to your music or your podcasts, if you do go across to Spotify, you can leave the show a five-star review. Just go to Spotify, search for recovery after stroke, the podcast will come up and then you can leave hopefully a five-star review if you think the show deserves it. Now, this has been happening more and more in the last few months as I've been asking people to do it. And I'm noticing that the number of downloads per month is starting to increase. The show has surpassed 5,000 downloads a month. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, considering that it first, when it first started, it was lucky to get maybe three or four downloads a week. So please feel free to go across to your favorite podcast app, even if it's not the Spotify one, leave the show a review, uh, tell people what you think of it. It'll help the podcast rank higher and it'll help the podcast be found by more stroke survivors and their caregivers. And hopefully it'll make their life a little easier and feel less alone. So I'd really appreciate if you did that. Now, today's episode is episode 189 and my guest today is Brian Caldwell who at the age of 35 is right now currently recovering from a hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke, as well as total kidney failure, likely the symptoms of undiagnosed high blood pressure. Also joining us was Brian's partner, Brittany, who had to step into being a caregiver as well as a mum. And despite all of their challenges, these two are super positive. They're a delight to interview, and I had such an amazing time getting to know them a little. I hope you enjoy this episode. Brian Caldwell, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure, man. Thanks for being here. Tell me a little bit about what happened. Well, uh, let's see how it started out. Um, I have no symptoms. Uh, I had some cramps in my leg, but I, I was, uh, I had a feeling it was from like low potassium or something like that. So I was taking a potassium supplement, but it wasn't doing anything. I kept having cramps. So that's the only symptom I had. But uh, so one day I was having a uh, Zoom meeting like we're having for a new job I was about to start. And um, basically I my wife was on the stairs right next to where I was having the Zoom meeting like we are on the, the computer here. And I was just sitting there and um, I basically got the job. And she was being nosy, listening on the stairs, saying, okay, babe, did you get it? And I yelled, babe. And then as I yelled, babe, put my head down, passed out. And that was it. And then I remember bits and pieces. Like, I wasn't completely incoherent, except for like the last three weeks that as I passed out beyond that. Um, but she basically kind of stepped in, uh, learned all about stroke, and it was caused from high blood pressure of my diabetes. And then, um, I don't know if you want to jump in and kind of tell most of the story here. Hey, Hello. who's that? This is, this is Brittany. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Come a bit closer. He's taking up the whole screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shove over, Brian. Um, yeah, so when we had gone to the hospital, he actually had a bleed in his brain, in his brain stem. And he was transported to the nearby stroke center. And they told me basically, how long have you known that his kidneys weren't functioning? I was like, I have no idea. And they said, we can't even push contrast through because his kidneys aren't working at all. And so I was like, huh, well, that's news to me. So they were on 
with um, a neurologist down in Salt Lake City, which is the main city in Utah. And they have a specialized neurology center over there. And so they wanted him to get transferred. Um, so it took him about two hours to get transferred down to Salt Lake. And by the time he got over there, he was totally out of it. He was like slurring his words. So it was like the stroke was progressing. Um, he had more like drooping on his left side. Um, and then at that point I had walked in cause I went, I thought, okay, he's going to go from one hospital to the next. They're just gonna, you know, do a workup, see what they can do for him. But by the time I got there, they said, Hey, we need to intubate him. Like he can't swallow. He's not, you know, projecting his airway. So we need to do what we can. So I said, okay, like, uh, is he going to make it out of this? Like what's going to happen? And they said, we don't know. We can't give you any definite answer. And I'm like, okay. So they basically pushed me out. Of course it's healthcare. So they, you know, come to me, they want my card. They want my information. So they make, want to make sure I can pay. And I actually called my boss who has a um, large family of doctors. And I said, Hey, this is the situation. This is what's going on. And so he got his sister on the phone who um, owns her own medical clinic in Arizona. And she was like, ask them how big the bleed was, ask them what kind of stroke it was, what it was caused from. So I basically had went right upstairs and I was like, are you the nurse? Yes. And I said, okay, how big was the bleed? And she's like looking at me. And so she goes, well, it was only a couple millimeters. And I said, okay, well, what kind of stroke was it? And so she said, well, it's a pontine hemorrhage, but we're still trying to decide specifically what it is. Cause they were trying to say it was a, I think caucus malformation, which they said could be something that he's had since he was very little. A cavernous um, malformation? That one. Yeah. Cavern cavernous malformation. So it was either that or he had what it more so seemed like over time when we were kind of figuring things out was that he had a lot of clots in his body from kidney failure, which he could have had the clot in his brain stem for a period of time. And then his kidneys weren't functioning. So obviously the blood pressure wasn't functioning as well, which caused essentially the clot to rupture in his brain and caused the bleed in his brain stem. So that's kind of the, the roundabout of what happened initially. Wow, 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 wow. That's crazy. Brian, did you know you had high blood pressure? First question. Um, I had been diagnosed years ago, but it was never like an ongoing issue. Like I was never fully diagnosed with hypertension. Okay, so no medication. Uh, I was taking some medication, but was unaware that I was supposed to take it consistently. Okay, and then second question is, you had no idea you had kidney failure. And is that common? Is that what happens? Um, it's not very common, but I didn't have very, in my younger years, I wasn't very controlled. Like my, my blood sugar was out of control. My, my eating habits were out of control. My exercise was off and on. I was fairly active. I mean, I played hockey. I was the, the coach of my son's hockey team right before I had my stroke. So I was active, but I wasn't very consistent as I should have been. Now it's different. You know, with my stroke, it's like, you know, it's a wake up call. I've, I'm very, very active just about every day now. Did you, but were you really, really bad or were you just a regular person? Because you, nobody's perfect with their diet. Nobody avoids, you know, uh, sugary drinks. Nobody avoids fast food. Most people do all that kind of stuff were you like out of control with that stuff or were you just a regular guy? I'd say when I was younger, I was probably more out of control. I'd say between the ages of like 18 to 25, I was basically an alcoholic with my friends. I basically just loved to have a good time with my friends. So okay. I think that's what caused my high blood pressure. And then I was undiagnosed over the years. And um, basically when I got older is when it kind of, you know, kicked my body's butt. Yeah, right. Okay. So what's it like, Brittany, when somebody talking one second, they've just got the job, and then they pass out? What do you what happened to you? Like, how did you cope with that? So I was being the nosy person that I am, I was 
kind of right aside him, up right up the stairs, because I wanted to know what happened. Um, I was, it just, we talk about it all the time. It's like the perfect storm. Everything happened in the perfect way. And I still almost don't believe it because he wanted to go to the desert that weekend and he was supposed to be driving home that day. And I told him, no, like, you know, you need to get a job. You need to do this. Like, then he called me a penny pincher or something. And I said, you're lucky I'm a penny pincher. I saved your life. Like you could have been on the road in the middle of nowhere and had your stroke. And then I usually at that time, I was on calls back to back to back at work. And I would shut my office door, put my headphones on and not hear anything that was going on. So when he was on the phone, it was like that 30 minute break of me not being on meetings. And he yelled and I thought, okay, maybe he just wants to tell me how, you know, what happened, how it went. And then I said, what? And then he didn't answer. So I was like, okay, whatever. So I went downstairs and he had like his head slumped over on the desk and he was like, kind of like slouching over his, you know, whole left side couldn't move. And I was just like, what's going on? And he was like, call 911, call 911. That's the only thing he could get out. So to me, I'm sitting on the phone with 911. They're asking me about his blood sugar. I'm like, it's not his blood sugar. He's not high. He's not low. Like he's having signs of a stroke. And I would hope that's not what it is, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And so when the ambulance came, the fire department, the sheriff, they all looked at him and they were like, he's too young. He's not having a stroke. And so he actually thought his sugar was going low. So he was chugging Snapple. And when he was chugging Snapple, it ended up that his sugar, when the paramedics got here, his sugar was well over 500. So he wasn't low. And then when he sugary got, drinks check. So, but then on top of that, his blood pressure was like around 230, 240. Wow. So it was just like all at once. And then they basically took him out. They took him over to the hospital. And it was kind of like this instant shock. What is going on? It happened to be the day where our son was home from school on top of that. So I'm trying to round up a dog and a seven-year-old, I'm trying to tell him to go upstairs because I didn't want to see what was going on, but I couldn't really control that, make sure he didn't fall over and hit his face or injure anything else. So I had to let things kind of play out. And then at that point, it's like, how do you explain to a seven-year-old that, hey, he left, he's in the hospital and he's going to be there for a little while. So it was, it was definitely tough. Like I, I didn't have time to clean the floors because he when he had the stroke, it uh, affected his swallowing. So he stopped swallowing. So all he was doing was drooling everywhere. And of course it was Snapple drool. So it smelled like Snapple every time I walked in the house. And it was like, I would just look at that area of where he was sitting. And it's like, it's just a bad dream. I'm just going to wake up from it. Like this isn't happening. And then it was like, every day it was the same thing over and over and over. Cause he was in the hospital for almost three months. Traumatic, huh? Yeah, definitely. What happens, Brian? You go to hospital, you get told all these things went wrong with you. What are you thinking, man? At that point, I don't even think I had control of my thoughts. I, I was so incoherent for a good three weeks. And I was doing hemodialysis, which is, you know, my, my uh, different levels were so out of control that they're trying to get my toxicity back under control. And, you know, uh, different levels are throwing my brain off and I can't think clearly. So I'm basically just sitting there letting them do whatever they want to do and just going with the flow. Wow. And then when you were, when they stabilized your kidneys and the dialysis started to work and all that kind of stuff, then did you have some deficits on your left side that you had to deal with and recover from? What were they? Oh, definitely. I had my full left side paralysis um, uh, all the way down to my leg. But luckily, within a few days, um, Brittany was stretching my leg pretty often. And that actually helped a lot. So my leg function came back pretty. I mean, it took a few, a little, uh, a few weeks of rehab to get it back. But my arm is completely, was completely useless. But, uh, you know, months go by and, and I've got some movement and you know, I'm able to still do some things like it's fairly functional. I just can't like grip some things and, 
you know, have full function, full mobility, but I'm working on that, the strength and stuff like that to try and get it back every day. You were 34 when it happened. Yep. Uh, how old are you now? 35. Okay. So it was not, not that long ago. It was only 12 or so months ago. Just last February. Wow. So it's pretty short amount of time. So you've gone from being relatively healthy, feeling okay, really capable of going out to the desert, do whatever you're going to do there up until that day. And then you're this completely different person from that day on. You got the job. Clearly, you didn't go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany's nagging didn't get you back to work. It got you a job, but not back to work. Uh, she's, I call her my sugar mama now. <laughs> you're living off her the good life right <laughs> I, would, I would say pretty close yeah i know you're I lucky nothing boy to complain about no nah, you haven't mate you're a lucky boy um i did the same thing right i li lived off my wife for quite a few years uh, on and off and um it was interesting and challenging and confronting and difficult what what was it what's it been like for you to kind of be unable to get back to some of the things that you were doing before stroke so as i got out of the or back home to kind of recovering within the first month i was kind of focused on like you know when's the depression going to kick in because i keep hearing about depression and i watched a movie in the hospital called seven yards it's on netflix and it's about a paraplegic he he becomes paraplegic when he's uh 19 i think from a bad football hit and, you know, I see that he's got a much worse life than I do, you know, not being able to move anything. So his goal was to walk seven yards down the aisle to get married. And that kind of gave me a motivation, like, you know, I'm not going to accept what I've been handed. Like, these aren't the cards I've been dealt. I can, you know, it's, it's basically like, um, almost like fate, like I need to, or my own destiny. I need to figure out my own destiny. I, if, if I want to be successful in whatever it's going to be, then I need to do it. I don't need to give myself excuses. Wow. And are you driving? Yeah, I started driving in. Oh, my wife's gone. Sorry. I started driving, I think, November. Okay. So that came back relatively quickly. They gave you permission to drive or you started driving? Yeah, the funny thing was I failed the first assessment with my occupational therapist. Um, it basically wasn't really my fault. It was more of a, a bad timing issue. Like they had canceled the appointment on me and I was upset. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to stand for this. Like, give me another appointment as soon as possible. And they were kind of upset that I did that and basically failed me on the spot. So then I went to another lady that was nearby and luckily she actually grew up in my hometown in a different state. So we actually got along really quick. So it was great. So, and at that point, I think I needed a little more time. It was like a month in between. And I probably needed that month in between just to, you know, get, gain a little more cognitive uh, ability. I, I never lo really lost my cognitive ability, but like, just like, you know, being able to multitask and keep my eyes open and, and focus on different things and, and notice the things around me. That really helped a lot with it, with my driving. I still get nervous from time to time, but it's a, it's a lot more uh, easygoing than it used to be. Did it impact your emotions? At first it did, but I that was like a big focus of therapy at first was, you know, I had uh, regular therapy like for my mind. So they would just, you know, consultate me all the time, just, reaffirm me like hey you're you're allowed to feel like this. this is what you're going to feel like and pseudo bull bar was like played a major part at the beginning so i cried uncontrollably all the time towards everything i mean the littlest things when i was sitting in my bedroom the first i think the first couple of days um my uh, nurse was coming in to train my wife on dialysis and i heard them talking about dialysis and I didn't realize how far along I was, if I was, what stage I was in, but I had overheard I was in stage five and I was like, wow, that's, that's really hitting home. So I probably cried harder than I've ever cried in my life at that point. And at that, 
you know, shortly after I kind of got used to it and just said, you know what, I just can't give myself excuses to feel bad for myself. I got to push forward. I got to try harder. I got to, you know, just do things to make myself happier. So I kind of focused on my crying more. There's times where like I, I wanted to cry, but I just held it in and said, hey, you got this. Just think about it a little harder. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Hmm, that's interesting. So what about your identity guys, like your combined identity before it was, you know, healthy husband, healthy wife, healthy child, healthy life, you know, everything was going good. But how did it change the way you guys interact as a family? I think my son uh, actually adjusted really well. Like he was, he's still very worried when things, you know, little things happen and he cries. I'm like, Hey dude, it's okay. But you know, he, he always, uh, what I struggle with sometimes is putting my socks on. So every morning he puts my socks on for me. So he loves to help out and he does a really good job of assisting with different things. And he doesn't really, I mean, a typical seven-year-old, of course, he's going to complain about stuff, but he loves to just, you know, whatever we're doing, he wants to help out. He wants to be a big kid. So he, he's done a really good job. I mean, Brittany, when I speak on behalf of her, she, you know, I would say that when we met, we've only been married for three years, but when we met five years ago, I wouldn't say she was very responsible, but within this last year, she has become my rock star. Like she has done everything, learned everything, taken care of everything. I mean, I have nothing to worry about whenever she handles something. All right, question, stop for a second. She was working, telling you to go and get a job. You weren't working. What do you mean she wasn't responsible? <laughs> I I wasn't really working when we had first gone together years ago and I kind of had to step outside of my comfort zone and go get a job put my son in daycare do do things like that that I didn't really want to do but he handled everything like he did laundry he would pay the bills he mowed the lawn. Like I suddenly became a gardener overnight, a bill payer, <laughs> accounts payable, account, like all of this stuff that I didn't want to do. And I had to do it. And then on top of that, it was like all of these little things he didn't take into account. Like I spent hours on the phone trying to figure out like disability, for example, and trying to get that process done. And that took six months alone or the transplant. It's like, I have a ginormous two inch binder of all of his stuff that he needs for transplant. And it's like, when he just, he looks at it, he's like, Oh, well, where's that? At? Oh, okay. So it's all here. Like we went to see his kidney doctor today and she was like, here, here's his labs. I know you guys are probably the only ones that actually keep these because you're actually responsible enough. <laughs> so I'm like, I like to look at this stuff. It's, it's interesting to me. And she also praised Brittany because she was there since I think the first week, second week, probably like day three. And she saw me when I was at my worst and she's a, a nice Indian lady. And she goes, you know, I'm so thankful that you are here. We are about to pull the plug on you. Gosh. <laughs> Brittany, so you had a massive change in mindset. Did you need such a drama to change your mindset and become, quote unquote, more responsible? What 
what do you think it will, I mean, obviously you need to help out, right? You need to step up, you know, in sickness and in health and death to us part. Probably you said that when you guys got married, maybe. So like, how did the mind shift? What happened with your mindset? How did it shift like that? I know what caused it. I think I was just very uh, focused into work. So I would, cause I work from home. So I would work, you know, get on the computer seven, 8 AM. And there were nights where I wouldn't get off till eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, get off the computer, separate time, separate. Then I'm like, it's so hard when my office is right next door and my mind is running a million miles an hour, but my priorities just weren't in line with what they should have been. And so when there's something drastic that's happening in life like this, it's like, you know what, work is going to be here tomorrow. And I've had that mindset to where the same work is going to be there. And if there's something that needs to be done today, then I got to get it done. If I have to take care of my son, because he's sick, if I have to take him to doctor's appointments, if I need to go to therapy. And luckily I have a really good job to where my boss understands the situation that I'm in and I don't, you know, get a hard time from it. Work never ends anyway. I mean, doesn't matter how much work you do. It never ends. There's always something to do tomorrow. Exactly. Um, that's really cool um, that you had the awareness to just realize that, okay, some priorities need to change and work is going to be second fiddle to everything else that's family uh, oriented. And look, that's what most people do. That's what my wife did. That's, that's what a lot of people do. But I get what you're saying about the chores and all that sort of stuff. Now you've got to step up and you've got to take over the whole running of the family, which was what my wife did. She became caregiver. She became a um, school mom. She became work, the main breadwinner. She became the person who had to look after her dad because my mother-in-law passed away at the same time that I was unwell. Uh, and it was, she just had to put everything on hold and do all of her things without really anyone asking her, uh, was she okay with it? You know, are you up for it? Is that what you want to do? Of course she said she wouldn't want to do it, but she did it. She did what she felt like she had to do. I was so lucky um, because I went through about three and a half, four years of bleed, a little better, another bleed, a little better, brain surgery. Uh, so it was just ongoing, this on, ongoing constant saga. Um, so have you put some of the things you love to do on hold? Have you found some time for yourself to do the things that you love, Brittany, where, where's that all at all the rest of your life? So I don't know. I mean, at first it was extremely hard. I felt like I would go to the hospital every single day and just be mentally drained by the time that I got back, because all he did was just cry. And I know that he couldn't help it, but he, you know, I'd get there at 9am and he's like, help, they're trying to kill me. And I'm like, no, they're not, you know, it, you're just in the ICU. You're having delirium, like hallucinations. They're trying to so, save you. Yeah. <laughs> and on top of that, I would leave for 20 minutes and he'd sit there and watch the clock and literally watch it tick. And then I would come back. You were gone a really long time. I'm like, no, I wasn't. So I, I didn't get a break the entire day. And then by the time I would get back at night, it's like, I had to explain what was going on with Logan, our son, and hey, he's okay. He just can't talk right now. And then I still had to work, you know, meanwhile, all of this, I still had to make sure our dog was getting taken care of, the house was somewhat taken care of. So I think I pushed all of my feelings aside for a really long time. And then on top of that, when he came home a couple months later, it was like, we went straight from this hospital adjustment to now we have to adjust with dialysis and doing dialysis every day. And what does that mean for us? And how is that going to change? And we were, we had so much more freedom the year before. If we wanted to go for a drive and enjoy the beautiful scenery, we could just go and do that. Now it's like, Hey, it's six 30. We need to go hook up to dialysis. And so it, it changed and it went from dialysis to doctor's appointments to therapies to it, every single week, there was probably three or four specialty appointments on top of therapies that he had to go to and it didn't stop. And I think it, it finally hit me like last October. And I'm just like, I think I'm just at my, like my brain, I can't take anymore because I just had taken care of everyone else for so long that I just 
I felt like I just needed to break down over and over and over and over again because I hadn't all year. And did you? Oh yeah, plenty of times. <laughs> so it was hard. And then it, it was hard because I was doing that when he was trying to stay positive and focus on his recovery. So it's like, now I feel like I'm being this negative person, but it just was like, it was a lot for me to kind of adjust and adjust with this new life. And how do we move forward it's so different and I just remember you know there's a lot of things that he doesn't remember because he wasn't there for he was so incoherent and I remember you know he was our son's hockey coach and the season was still ongoing when he went into the hospital and every Friday was his hockey practice and I said hey let's go to hockey I'll I'll meet you there I'll take you and he's like no if he's not going to be my coach out there I don't want to go and I'm like So it was really hard. He didn't want to go for pretty much the rest of the season. And then when this season started, I was like, Hey, I I think you should do it. He'd want you to do it. And so we had a big conversation with him. Like he may not ever be able to be your coach again, but just get out there and go have fun. And he had fun when he, he did it. And he's like, I'm glad I went ice skating again or played ice hockey again. Is that hard for you to listen to Brian? Um, It's hard to be a spectator, to be honest. I hate, I hate, I like participating in basically everything, but um, when I just have to experience like the whole ordeal myself with her, it's been an experience. So I've, I've grown more, no doubt. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure she has also. It sounds like you both have adjusted, grown, learned new things about yourself. You've changed your diet dramatically. I, I imagine, um, Brian, is that right? So what are you Definitely. not consuming these days? What are you not consuming? So with the dialysis and the diabetes and stuff like that, just watching my blood pressure, make sure that's okay and controlled. I watch potassium, sodium, carbohydrates, sugar, anything that tastes good. It's out of my diet. <laughs> he can't eat cheese anymore. No he beans. Can't eat beans. But I, I cheat sometimes. When when like today, for instance, um, I got my my levels and my my blood checked and everything was great and beyond beyond good. So I said, you know what, let's go have a cheeseburger today. <laughs> so we went out. I didn't eat the the buns, which is all the carbs, but I did splooge on French fries and cheese and stuff like that, which I never have. It doesn't affect me that much, but yeah. every now and again it's, it's like you know, I've always lived by, I don't want to die unhappy. I want to, you know, experience some things that I enjoy. So yeah. I'm not going to just give up on the things completely that I enjoyed before. So the little things been in um, having a proportion or portion controlled and, and, you know, uh, taking them in uh, seldomly, like, you know, here and there, not all the time, just, you know, give your body a break. So I, for the most part, 90% of the time, I take care of my body in and out, no problem. And then when it comes time to cheat, you know, I don't feel guilty. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough, man. I get that. So what about your sleep? Did you get uh, any sort of changes in the way that you slept or are you sleeping? Okay. Has that become worse or better? Is it okay? I'd say because of dialysis, the machine loves to to beep at me if my line, my dialysis line gets crimped. So the fluid doesn't flow. So it just screams at me until I wake up and it's loud. So that wakes me up. You know, it depends if it's a good night or a bad night. If it's a bad night, it'll wake me up five, six times. If it's a good night, I'll sleep all the way through. So I usually, I mean, basically every night I wake up right when dialysis ends. So about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And I get up and usually, you know, go right to the gym, right to my workout and get things done before I have to take my son to school. And usually if I don't get it done before school, then I come home and do it that way. Or I pick Brittany up and we go both go to the gym together. And, you know, we kind of have motivated each other for the most part. Uh, You know, I was working out for myself and then I got Brittany to work out for herself. And, you know, I think my motivation probably rubbed off on her a little bit to kind of get herself in check and her health in check. So she's on a, you know, a diet right now where she's eating better and she has more energy and, you know, things are just 
properly flowing the way it should and her her mood is better my mood's better you know it's just it's it's funny how the the vibrations just go off one person and just affect all the people around you absolutely food is huge on that i mean it increases your blood pressure it increases your blood sugar and all those things increase your cortisol levels your stress hormone uh, then you have a a food coma crash if you've eaten too many carbs and then that's no good for energy levels and you can't get stuff done i mean food is probably one of the most critical things that people can do to manage their symptoms of stroke and feel better the better you eat the better it, it is the less inflammation that occurs in the brain the better the neurons rewire and refire to give you back movement and all that kind of stuff so it's a massive part of the recovery of course it's a massive part of dialysis uh treatment as well how often is dialysis and how many hours does it take 10 and a half hours every night and can you break it is there a way to make it five hours uh, at say midday and then five hours at midnight was there an option for that i think Brittany could talk on that she knows she's more educated than i am i don't think so because it runs cycles back to back to back and so there's four cycles which totals the 10 hours um but i think it works out better because he just well if he slept through the machine beeping he would be able to sleep throughout the night and then he's free to do whatever he can versus going to a clinic three times a week four or five hours so that's why i i kind of made the decision for him when he was in the hospital that go to those therapies he needed to go to doctor's appointments and then to have to worry about going to dialysis three times a week it just would have been really hard on top of that, he needs a transplant and hemodialysis was very hard on the heart. And so it could have affected him uh, heart wise. And he's already got on top of everything else, a 40% blockage in one of his arteries in his heart. So we didn't want to make anything worse. Brian, stop it with all the drama, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, everyone says that, you know, God was pretty hard on you. Is he ever going to give you a break? I don't think God's got anything to do with it. I think it, <laughs> I, mean, I feel like you're the guy that's gonna take have to take responsibility here and sort, uh, I, and yeah, sort yourself out. That's definitely true. That's I mean, I I think that's part part of my recovery is having to realize that I had to take responsibility for basically my health. Like I've got myself here. This is definitely hundred percent preventable if I would have made better decisions when I was younger. But, you know, as I got older and didn't really watch my diet, kind of ate whatever, I, I kept up on my, my, my insulin and my sugar, but I just ate whatever I wanted. So it's like, it wasn't good for my health overall. God wants you here. All the shit that you've done to your body, God's going, hang on a sec, Time, your time's not up yet, Brian. You know, stuff, there's stuff to do, there's things you need to learn and discover and teach your son and um and you know and work out with your wife and god's going you know like let's let's go again let's have another try let's sort it out oh uh, it's definitely changed my perspective on life like how you know i i look at it as you know i'm not been told that my my story is inspiring and you know my recovery is much better than they expected and you know it all comes from hard work really yeah yeah hard work definitely a lot of luck even though it seems like you've been unlucky actually you've been extremely lucky to still be here to within a year be on a podcast talking about it like you're looking healthy and fantastic i know that you may not feel that way every day but you're looking great and that's a great start. You got a supportive wife who's done everything and she's just moved heaven and earth to make sure that you're well and everything's okay. I mean, you're a lucky boy. You are such a lucky boy. I love that you're here. To and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if this happened 50 years ago when our parents were growing up, 
they wouldn't have survived it. The people back then wouldn't have been around, would they? Uh, I think my millennialish mind kind of uh, focuses on my stroke mind, and it's it it makes me look at things different. Yeah. Be stubborn, in other words. I'm yeah. not going to be like this the rest of my life. And the funniest thing that I think is before his stroke, I would try to talk to him about his diabetes or, you know, his insulin or get him to go to the doctors. And it was, I know nothing about diabetes. I know nothing about anything that he's going through. When he came home from the hospital, it was like, okay, here's your lunch. I'm giving you your insulin. No questions about how much I was giving him. No questions about what I was giving him. And it's like every single day is his levels were perfect. So why don't we listen to our spouses though? It doesn't matter who I speak to, you know, we'd never listen to them. It's like, yeah, shut up. Leave me alone. Stop nagging. We don't ever listen. And usually our spouses are coming from a good place. They're coming from a caring place. Maybe they don't know exactly how to express it to show their care, their caring concern for your health. And they kind of um, sound nagging and whinging and complaining. But why don't we ever listen, Brian? I don't have a perfect answer to that. But my answer for myself personally is I looked at it that she was younger than me. So she didn't experience more than I did. And I, and over time now, especially my perspectives change. I mean, I see that she's more responsible. She, she took control of, she stepped up to the plate. I mean, I can trust her with anything and everything now. Before it was questionable. <laughs> How much younger? She's eight years younger. Yeah. She's eight years younger now. She has to put up with all the sexy stuff in the bedroom, you know, the dialysis <laughs> machines, the beeping and all that kind of stuff. Come on, man. You know, you could have done better. You should have done better. Uh, what's that like, actually? How has it impacted intimacy and all that kind of stuff? If you don't want to talk about it too much, you don't have to. Oh, I'm, I'm okay with opening up. She's not so much opening, opening up, but... Uh... Uh, I'd say, you know, it's definitely affected both of us in a sense, but more her than myself. I'd say physically it's affected me a little bit, but, you know, I have my days where I tell her like, hey, I'm having an on day, like, let's go. And she's like, you know, you, all the all the typical excuses. I'm too Did tired. I... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm hungry. I didn't eat today. I didn't exercise. I worked too hard. You know, all those and for me, it's like, hey, this is once in a blue moon. I'm going to feel like this. So let's let's do it. Yeah. So, but her, her, on the other hand, it's like, you know, she looked at me basically before like, hey, I'm a lot of fun. And that's just the way I am. And, you know, I'm very bubbly and outgoing. And, you know, I was very affectionate before, but she's never been an affectionate person. So now that with my stroke, I'm actually a lot more affectionate. So I'm actually like, I'm, I'd say I always been saying since like five years ago. So I was like, you know, I'm the girl in the, the relationship. I like to cuddle. I like to love. I like the hand holding. I like kisses. I like all that stuff. She hates it. Wow. You know, it's like when I, when I reach out to kiss her, she's like, ew, your breath, your breath stinks or something. <laughs> she's like, stay away from me. And I'm like, come on. I just want to kiss. And she's like, no, get away. I wow. think it was hard at first because I always told him he's like a stage five clinger. Like I, <laughs> I would go in my office to work and he, we, I have a bed right behind me in my office. Cause it was like our guest room slash office. And he would come in here and fall asleep on the bed and I would be on meetings and he's behind me snoring. And I'm like, <laughs> get out of here. Like, give me space. I'm like, this is just different for me. When you didn't have your stroke, you were at least out, you were working, you were outside working on your truck. You were just doing something. I'm like, you never leave. Like as wrong as that sounds, you're always here. So, so when he's like wanting to cuddle and wanting, I'm like, just get away. Like, so no. now <laughs> it comes to the point where, you know, I'm well enough to go and do stuff. And I, I try to stay out of the house and keep busy and do different tasks. So now when I leave, she's always calling me where are you? When are you going to be home? I want you home. You know, she does the, the complete uh, opposite of what she was telling me. And um, just the, 
just having a good time with it and making, making sure she's bugging me now because I bugged her so much before. Yeah, I love it. So is some of it actually, Brittany, you're worried about him and thinking that maybe something's gone wrong if you haven't heard from him for too long? Is it something like that? Yeah, I think, and that's what I was struggling with a lot when he first started driving in August is he would leave and I'm like, where are you at? And the, he wouldn't answer. He had this, he would take his phone everywhere he went, but he was horrible at answering his phone. And so I'm sitting there stressing out. What if he had another stroke? What if something happened? His blood sugar is low. And so it was more of me worrying. And then it, it freaked me out even more driving around with our seven-year-old. I don't want something bad to happen. And then he feels he has to now take responsibility. And it just happened. We went to an event um, a couple weeks ago and his sugar was so low. I was like, Hey, I'll go get the truck. We can leave. And so I left our seven-year-old inside with him to watch him because I didn't want to leave him there and have him pass out. And my seven-year-old's calling, uh, calling me on his watch. Cause he has like a phone watch where he can call me and him. And he's like, but he handled it so well. I think you need to come in here right now. And I'm like, Hey, I'm trying to find a parking spot. Just give me a few minutes. And he's like, he's about to pass out. Can you please go get help? Like the most calmest voice. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't even care. I'm parking in red zone. They can tell me for all I care. So I ran back inside and it was like, I had gotten in. I, I got the paramedics because I just needed like glucose tablets or something to get his sugar up. And I think he said at one point it was like 37. So he was on the verge of passing out if he wasn't trying to pass out. And so things like that just freak me out. And then having to put our son in that situation too, it, it's tough. That is tough. It's tough for anybody, let alone a seven-year-old. But kids are resilient. They are troopers. They they know how to help out. When they become a teenager, they'll be he'll be a complete pain in the ass, right? But <laughs> um, still, isn't it amazing that a seven-year-old can take and can instruct you, give you all the information that you need, um, update you, let you know what's happening, and just do it as if, you know, it's just part of his day, like regular stuff, you know, I got to look out for this old bloke who can't do anything for himself right now. Yeah, and he does that at first, it was, hey, let's run to the store, let's go here. And he's like, but what if his sugar goes low? Like, what if something happens to him? And I'm like, it's fine, because I, I made him get a continuous glucose monitor. So the Dexcom, and I downloaded the app on my phone, because he didn't have that before the stroke. And I tried to get him to many, many times. He just didn't do it. So I have the app on my phone. So anytime he's going low, if he doesn't text me back right away, if I'm like, Hey, are you eating something? Are you drinking something? I'll call him, call him, call him. Cause I don't want him to be sleeping to where he's so low. He passes out. I don't want to have to go through all of that again. <laughs> yeah. And, and that gives you alerts as well. Doesn't it? When it's noticing it's too low or something's up. Yeah, it does. Yeah, well, that, that's a bit of a relief. And yeah, I, I know what you're saying about checking in all the time, you know, that was one of the things that was happening at our house, people were wondering, all the time where I was what I was doing, am I okay, especially when my wife had to go back to work at some point and leave me at home alone. I had a couple of falls, which she found out about, you know, when she came home, because luckily, they weren't too bad. And um, but I did tell her that I fell. So then there was concerns about that. And there's all sorts of concerns and things you need to take into consideration. Um, technology plays a big part in helping out, doesn't it? Yes, we actually, so I got a camera for our loft and I got a camera for our living room for our son because he was doing a lot of very questionable things when we weren't around and he would sneak away when I was, when we were doing dialysis and we would find stuff under the couch and, you know, all of this random stuff. But I actually use it for him too, because I'm like, Hey, is he okay? Like if I'm gone, you know, is he just sleeping on the couch? Like that's fine. And I actually plan to travel here pretty soon for work. And I think it'll just make me feel a little bit better. I feel like a complete stalker, like no question about it, but I also, I'm okay because I, I know that if something does happen, I can easily see, Hey, he's on the ground. Let me call for help. Yeah. And the good thing is we have all these very supportive neighbors. 
So anything, if I need anything, we can basically go to any direction and they're there. So community support is really high uh, and you guys have got good relationship with everybody. Definitely. Yeah, that's a relief. That's such a good thing. A lot of people don't have that either. Uh, it's such a struggle for some people not to have support and not to have a community. What about stroke? Did you get curious about stroke and needing to find stroke survivors and needing to learn from them? Who was it that reached out to me? I can't remember. Uh, that was me, actually. I was at the gym and I'm struggling with motivation and inspiration. So I was looking just on Apple Podcasts and yours was the first to pop up. So I listened to a bunch of different episodes and I'd reach out saying, you know, this is very interesting. I want to jump on there and tell my story. Yeah. Does it help to tell your story? I, I would say I just want to help others. It doesn't help me necessarily, but I want to help others. I, I actually got bored within my first few months of being home. So I, without, it's not uh, current, but it, back in the day, it was, I started a charity. So I actually was able to give away about $6,000 to different people that were struggling financially with that's the, with six, the stroke it was. That's six grand that you needed for yourself, I imagine, and you were giving it away? No, luckily that we're fairly well off, so we're not too worried, but lots of people, you know, they have struggled playing, paying co-pays. Like with, here in the States, I don't know, do you have universal health care in, in Australia? We do. So we have to pay over here in, in the States. So a lot of people struggle with paying $20, $50. So, you know, just like when I saw people, like I was in the, the stroke support group on Facebook, a couple of different ones. So I just saw like people here and there talking about, you know, I just can't pay for my copays this month. And, you know, things are so hard. And I just, you know, just, I'd reach out to a whole bunch of them and, some of them were reluctant to, to accept the money and say, thank you so much. You've changed my life and this and that. Some people thought it was a scam. So they call me a scammer and I'm like, you know, that's fine. Call me whatever you want to call me, but you don't get no money. <laughs> no, it wasn't our money. It was actually friends who wanted to just donate yeah. and help other people. And I thought it was actually pretty nice because it's when gorgeous. people would write back and it was like, you know, to still, some people still will message him just from time to time and say, how are you doing? You know, so it's, I think it's just an interesting thing. I thought when I saw the GoFundMe, I'm like, did he really set up a GoFundMe for us? Like, we don't need the money. <laughs> she, she, we had thought about it for a couple months saying, you know, I was like, do, should we set one up? Like, is this something that we should do? Cause I see everyone doing it. And I'm like, and she goes, no, we don't, we don't need to do that. We don't need to ask for money. I'm like, but what if it's for other people, you know? Uh, and then luckily, you know, before my stroke, I was a networker. I used to network with everyone. Part of my job was a marketing person and I was a salesperson. So I have tons of friends and I was like, you know what? Why don't I, not in a bad way, but why don't I use my friends? Why don't I see if they want to donate? And sure enough, they did. And I just ran with it and helped out a few people and it felt really good. So I just... For a while, I kind of ran with it, and uh, Brittany was supporting me after she heard what I was doing, because I kind of did it on the, the back end without telling her what it was about. It's really cool. I mean, I'm, brag I'm bragging a little bit, but I needed to help out as well, which is weird. I don't know why I needed to help out other stroke survivors or other people. And so many of the people who are on the podcast have been on there. I've done nearly 190 episodes they all wanted to help out other people. And it's really strange that some of them are going through the shittiest time they could possibly go through. And they're still thinking about helping other people. And I just love that. I've never paid attention to that. I've never seen that before in people in my community anywhere, especially people that are well. Most people that are well don't really give a shit about other people. And then somehow something changed. And, and I was... Maybe I did give a shit, but I didn't go out of my way to do something supportive and helpful for free. That cost me money. So something changes. What changes in your brain to go, hang on a sec. I'm going through a really tough time. This has been really bad. And there's other people probably going through a tough time. That's bad for them. And why don't we help them 
at the same time that I'm trying to recover? Does it make your recovery easier, better? Does it mean more? Like, what is it? I think it does make it better. I think, obviously, I was telling you about how my perspective has changed. I, I was a nice giving person before. And there was a time, one time, where we were going through a, a hamburger drive through And I had paid it forward with the people behind us and said, hey, what did they order? Let me pay for it. And Brittany yelled at me and said, why are you paying for them? You know, we don't need to spend money on other people. And it kind of triggered her a little bit. And now she's a different person with the way we look at things together. And, you know, for me, it makes me feel better. I'm really, I'm realistic about life and recovery and how we should approach things. And, you know, what's the reason of having an excuse? What's, I mean, I, I want to recover as quickly as possible. If I give myself excuses, that's less, less chance I'll probably recover. So I can't talk about if I like, uh, I was listening to your previous episode with Corey Getz and he spoke about uh, telling your brain positive things and your brain reacts in a positive manner. Yeah, so that's absolutely. basically how I kind of approach things is, you know, stay in a positive direction, tell myself positive things. Don't listen to my, my negative thoughts because that gets me nowhere. And that's yeah. a realistic yeah. thought. Like, allow yourself to have them too it's okay to have them just don't give them too much airtime. that's all any, yeah any power yeah Corey was in episode 173 he's a real cool dude um and he's doing some really good work trying to work out whether or not um cannabis oil can be used to support people recovery uh after stroke and probably lots of other things and I'm not sure how he's done it, but he's actually doing proper studies where they're researching it and they're going to have a proper study and then a proper report after it. And it's like really awesome stuff. Corey's amazing. So um, he too, he's kind of like, you know, he's like the surfer dude from California, you know, and, you know, he talks like that and that's his whole lifestyle. He's this, he just reminds me of that that thing that we've always seen on TV about how dudes from California are on the surfboard and then at the beach, that's kind of him. He's just a really <laughs> easy go lucky guy. And there is his mindset is just so chill and relaxed and we're going to get through this and we're going to find solutions. We're not going to focus on the problems and um, yeah, his awesome work. Um, that thing that you said about Brittany being triggered previously about um spending money on other people that reminded me of me i've been there before as well and i don't know why i mean i got no idea why i would spend money on my friend uh buying them a drink or a coffee or a meal or whatever and they would to me too and i would accept that back but i also didn't ever consider that possibility that i might shout a stranger a coffee or a drink or a meal um and i do that now because i just feel like i mean I would spend it 10 bucks on a good a, feeling. Yeah, I would it spend 10 bucks on gives, somebody I, else. Why I wouldn't think I just more in touch with your your emotions? So with your stroke. Yeah. So when you do nice things, it makes you feel a lot better internally. It does. It makes a big difference to the other person as well. They get a real surprise and a shock, and they feel like, you know, wow, humanity's all right. Or someone did something nice for me and I didn't need to pay it back or do anything for it. And yeah. So Brittany, what's it like for you now to remember how you kind of were before what, what your thought pattern or process was like before? I just don't think it's the same at all. I think I've changed in probably in every way, but not in, I would say not in a worse way. I think I've grown up and matured probably a lot more in a lot of different ways that I probably wouldn't have this quick. And I just, I don't know. It's different. I mean, he talks about giving money away and I'm like, well, who, who's like a caregiver? I want to go on the caregiver mm. group because there's a lot of people struggling and yes. I go on those groups and, you know, I'll read their stories and then I'll almost feel thankful that he, yes, he had a stroke, but he's still here because people will talk about how, um, you know, their stroke survivor that they have to take care of will yell at them and will cuss at them and will throw things at them and they're abusive and I don't have to deal with that. So it's unfortunate that he had a stroke, but 
he's not nearly as severe as I would say a lot of people, a lot of other people that are out there. And I think he's pretty fortunate for the, the circumstances that he was in yeah. altogether. And when he had gotten to the hospital, they had said that his kidney function was at 5%. So it's almost as if it was like probably a couple more months probably would have went by and he would have just passed in his sleep from kidney failure. So it's unfortunate that he had a stroke, but it's almost a good thing that he had a stroke. Yes. Yeah. So he, uh, it's a, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise. Yeah. It's a wake up call for sure. Yeah. Are you a better mom because of all this stuff? Um, I, <laughs> you're a great mom. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you weren't, but are you a better mom? Not better to your kid or, you know, changes clothes better or whatever, but like, are you a better version of a mom? Like than you were, I would say I'm probably more present than I was. Yeah. Uh, and more here. And like I said before, I just was so into work. I just didn't want to deal with it. And now it's like, let's go do this. Let's go take him here and just have fun. Or let's sit there and play Uno, even though he gets mad and tries to steal all the wild cards. <laughs> and I think that's where I still have my cognitive ability was, you know, I, I rip her pretty hard for her, like, you know, cause she always says, Oh, you're the cool parent. And, and I'm just, you know, chopped, uh, what is it called? Chopped, chopped liver, chopped liver over here. So, so our son, Logan, Logan doesn't even like to hang out. And I'm like, that's because you don't do anything fun with them. You don't participate. And I'm like, go do stuff with them, you know? And she does it now. She's, she's more aware than she used to be. So I, so I think that he's, you know, he, he tends to use us against each other at first. Hmm. So, you know, we, we figured that out and, you know, we're working with each other rather than against each other now. So I think that she is, you know, that's her growing in a way, like, you know, as you get older and figure things out and realize that you could have been better than what you were, that's her, you know, getting to age, basically. So I, I'm still saying, hey, she's 27 and still has her moments where I'm like, you know, palm to the forehead, like, why are you acting like this? Then yeah. I remember like, you know, just because of my stroke and I my perspective's a little bit different, you know, I probably realize i'm a little bit of a pain in the ass too and she's reacting to the way i'm acting for sure you are brian 100 <laughs> percent yeah and when you're 20 and you have a kid at 20 i mean you're barely you, you're barely just you were just a kid not that long ago like you you've got no idea i was a young dad i was 22 when i had my my wife gave birth to um our first son I had no idea. I had no idea for a good, oh man, the best part of the first 10, 12 years, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Um, his younger brother is four years younger than him. And I was getting it wrong a lot of the time. And I, ego was a big part in my life, you know, and it was the stroke that made me realize at 37 that I need to make some things good. I need to go back and repair some of the stupid things that I said did behave like and, and, and kind of um, let them know that I'm, I'm going to try and change and be a better version of a dad. I was a pretty good dad, but I just, I had, didn't have a lot of resources to handle complex situations. So I used to default to the one dumb thing, which was yelling all the time and screaming and making them feel like um, they couldn't speak up and give me their perspective it was never a conversation a two-way conversation about what they thought and what i thought it was always about how i saw it and what the rules were and how there was no getting around them and all that kind of stuff and i was just a bit of a tense hard ass and i sort of started to let them speak and pay attention and it took a while to undo all the mess that i had made you know to make them feel comfortable with talking to make them feel comfortable with saying stuff that they knew I wasn't going to like to hear. And then to me, not, not to respond and act like an idiot again, it was to stop and just give them a, a, a space to express themselves, you know, and tell them and allow them to tell me when I was being stupid that, hey, you are actually being stupid to me right now. You better stop that. And me actually take that as a really good thing that I'm being 
I'm being checked, you know, my behavior is being checked by them because I'm making them feel bad for some, in a way that's not, not productive or supportive of their growing and learning because they're teenagers and they're learning and they're growing. And I wasn't, I think that our path would have been completely different if I continued to be that kind of guy. They just would have been more disconnected from me and more and less likely to come to me when they needed help. And that really scared me. You know, I really wanted to make sure that I was going to be able to be there when they needed help and they did something stupid as a teenager does, you know. So when you're 20 and you have a kid and you're just a kid yourself, it takes a lot of growing up there's so much to learn at 20 between 20 and 30 there's so much to learn especially when you know you become a mum that young Brittany do you relate to that does that kind of feel similar yeah I think so like I was somewhere the other day and she uh, I think the lady had asked me do you have kids and I'm like yeah I'm gonna have an eight-year-old this year and she's like what you look like you're maybe maybe 20 and I'm like I know. I sometimes don't believe that I have an eight-year-old either. So I was very young, very immature, naive. And I think just as I've grown as a person, it, there's a lot that's changed, whether that's in our relationship and the relationship that I have with him. There's things that I could see last year where it's like, he, you know, he was going through a lot. And how do you not get mad at a kid for the things that they were doing? because then I was also feeling bad at the same time, but then it, it just became a struggle because you also have to be a parent and tell them, no, that's not right. Like there was one time he went to the grocery store with him and just stole gum because he just wanted gum. And we made him go back and return it to the manager. And he just bawled his eyes out, but it's like, Hey, you're, you can't do that. And you're not going to just get away with it because we're all going through a tough time right now. Otherwise, he's going to continue getting away with it. Yeah, yeah. I um, I get the whole. So when I'm not shaved, you get to see a little bit of gray whiskers, but I don't have any gray in my hair. So when I shave, you know, people think I'm 47. People sometimes say to me, "You look like you're maybe in your late 30s, something like that." So I still, and then they say to me, "How old is your son?" And I say, "My oldest son's 25," and they're like, "Whoa, you don't look like you've got a 25 year old." But that's a really lovely thing. It's good that. It was so difficult financially when I had kids young. Um, we did it tough for a good 10, 15 years. Um, we didn't go without, but it was really tough, you know, to cover all the bills and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but now my kids, I'm 47. My kids are 25 and 21. The 25-year-old moved out a year, less than a year ago. And the 21-year-old is looking at moving out already. You know, me and his mum, mom, their mum is a few years older than me. She's three years older than me. And it's like, we've kind of like free, free of them. And we're only around the 50 mark. And it's really cool to have this relationship and a very small generation gap between us and them. We kind of get most of their stuff and their lingo and their uh, technology. We've kind of still there. And we have these really great conversations with our kids that I never would have expected at 25. Uh, when, when they're, they're 25. Now, I, there's so much good has come from it that I just never in my wildest dreams expected that it would be this good. So um, you've got a lot of amazing things to look forward to. And even 34, Brian, that's not that old, you know, to have an eight-year-old. That's not that old. So I actually, uh, last December, or was it? it was December 2020. Yeah, December 2020, uh, about two, three months before my stroke, that's when I had adopted uh, basically her son. So that's when Logan became my son. Properly. And I decided then like, you know, I'm accepting the responsibility to set a better example because, you know, I never thought about that before. I was a dad, but I wasn't fully a dad yet. So like, you know, now I, my perspective is different. I'm like, you know, I have to, while I'm here, it's my second chance to set a better example. So I even tell her all the time, like, we need to not fight. We need to, you know, close the door. You need to, you know, not let him come into the conversation when he's not supposed to. Not let him eat what he wants to eat all the time. 
But then again, you know, I'm pretty, I'm like a kid on the inside. I let him do whatever he wants to do at certain times. And, you know, I'm his buddy sometimes, but when it comes to being a dad, I step up and, you know, I, I also, uh, uh, give him a hard time about like, you know, doing the right thing and, you know, chiming in and, and, uh, helping out when he's supposed to. And he does, he does a great job. And I think that's what's raising him to be a better kid is I think my stroke has impacted that times 10, like in all honesty, he's seven and causes a lot of trouble within his own right, but he's a great kid. He, yeah. he listens, he does what he's supposed to, he does his homework, he helps out, he, I mean, even with other kids, he's motivating, he likes to make friends, you know, stuff that kids should be doing. They don't sit around and if someone's hurt, he's going to help them. He's that type of kid. Just wait until they become teenagers. All those lovely things, they <laughs> stay there. They, he, it just gets buried a little bit for a few years and then it comes back, all right? So hold on. It's about eight, nine, ten years worth of pain and suffering that you're going to go through but she, she he'll come that around he's not allowed to have girls over until he's 35 yeah. and i said yeah you watch in a couple of years he's going to have a girl over and he's going to be coming to me saying hey he calls me babe because that was his first word because she calls me babe and he goes, <laughs> i love it hey, he's going to say hey babe i'm going to have a girl uh come over and watch a movie is that okay and i'm going to say yeah it. sure come on over of course and i think it's good that because when I was a teenager, I was a reckless teenager. I did all, I caused all kinds of trouble. And my parents had always told me, you know, when you have a kid, you're going to get it back tenfold when you're older. And sure as hell, I'm getting it back. Yeah. So yeah. I, I can remember the things I did. So when I see him starting to do the things, I'm like, yay, I can call it out and say, you know, I know you're lying. I know that this is going to happen. I know that. The, don't even try to play around the bush. Yeah, it's it's good to remember the things that you did that were stupid when you were a teenager, because then you, you, you're not so hard on the dumb decision that a teenager has made just now. You're kind of like, all right, I know what you did. I know, I, I know why you did it. Now let's talk about how we're not going to do that again or how we're going to improve or whatever. And that's really good that you remember how you got yourself into a stupid situation when you were a teenager. I certainly try and do that. And um, sometimes my kids are shocked when I say to them, you know, that thing that you did that was really bad. I, I've done that as well. So don't. I think it's easier to talk to a seven year old than a teenager. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. It changes. <laughs> it does. It's really difficult, but look, you'll be fine. Brittany um, forget about the, uh, thing about the girl thing it's not going to happen he's going to do what he wants in that situation and you'd rather have <laughs> them you'd rather have them at home than somewhere else yeah. that's a thing that i learned i was better off they were at our house being stupid or doing whatever having fun than somewhere where they weren't safe or whatever and it's like okay i'll live with that uh, it's okay um but so you know before we said that um, Brian was lucky that, it, that that Brittany was around. But Brittany sounds like she's a little bit lucky too, Brian. I, I would say that I'm a catch, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't try to be too full of myself. <laughs> love it. I love it. Guys, it's been so fun talking to you. Thank you so much for reaching out and asking to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being open and uh, coming on and talking about all sorts of things that are difficult and hard and whatever. Heal well. I uh, feel like uh, you're well on the way. hope your recovery goes well. I hope everything goes well with the kidneys and the blood pressure and all that stuff. Brittany, you're doing an amazing job. Well done. Congratulations. Um, take time out for yourself. Give yourself heaps of Brittany time uh, without Brian. Now that you've got all the surveillance gear in action. <laughs> catch up with the girls, you know, go get your nails done, do all that stuff, leave them at home every once in a while. And um, yeah, look, feel free to reach out anytime. And I look forward to um, hearing from you whenever you feel like it. Well, thanks for having us on, Bill. I mean, I appreciate everything you do. That's why I reached out. So I just want to thank you for everything. Thanks. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Nice meeting you. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. 
I told you it was going to be fun and we had a lot of fun getting to know each other. These two are such a great team working together to overcome all their challenges, taking things in their stride, stepping up where they need to, taking responsibility. I just really, really love this episode. So thank you for being here. I hope you got a lot out of it too. If you're watching on YouTube, please comment, like, share, give the show a thumbs up, subscribe. Um, also hit the notification bell so that you can get notified of new episodes. Uh, any comments, any interaction with the show, wherever you find it, uh, will help rank better. And therefore, when the show is ranking better, it'll be found easier by other stroke survivors. It'll make a massive difference to the way the recover their recovery might go. It'll make a massive difference to their caregivers. It'll help them feel less alone and hopefully help them reach out and get some support. So thanks so much for listening. I really do appreciate you. And uh, I hope to hear from you soon. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.